Um, the two most popular supplements, creatine and caffeine. What are your thoughts on that for, for the female athlete? Creatine is essential. It's a nutrient that every woman should be Thank taking. You. Right? Yeah. And, and yet it's, it's not, hard to get people to take it. It's hard I to get know, it's to take crazy. It. We've done a, I, well, personally, I've pushed my social media and I've done so much in the past year trying to get women to understand that creatine is not a bodybuilding supplement that, you know, it's not harmful. It's essential for brain health. We see clinical studies where people are in severe depression and they increase creatine use and they don't have to use SSRIs because wow. it pulls them out of depression. Why? Because it's so essential for brain metabolism. I have my athletes who have a lot of GI distress use creatine because it increases the mucosal lining integrity. So then they don't end up with GI distress as they're exercising. We know that women have 70 to 80% of the stores that men do. So just by supplementing with that three to five grams a day improves muscle function, improves brain health, improves cardiovascular health, gut health, all of these things. And there's so many women now who are on some kind of exclusionary diet, you know, so they're excluding some kind of food group, which then decreases the ability for your body to pull in creatine from dietary sources. Um, yeah, so creatine super, super important for health. And then you can also look at it from a performance standpoint too. Like if you want to do your traditional dosing without carbohydrate, that significantly improves muscle function. So yeah, can't say enough good things about creatine. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, three to five grams seems sufficient, Dr. Stacy. Uh, on that? Okay. Yeah. yeah. For yeah. the further, I, I, because we don't have a lot of thoughts, and I, I don't think we look too much at the potential disparity in needs between men and women, and the dosage, the dosaging has been relatively just constant across the board. So, yeah. I mean, but obviously, body weight and full body size, total body size, is a variable in that that I think we discount all too often, and just say, well, if you want the neuroprotective benefits, you got to take ten grams. But if you weigh ninety nine pounds or hundred pounds, it, obviously, you wouldn't need that high dose in men. Yeah. yeah, I can't. I can't do the ten grams. Huh? Yeah, I have a conversation a lot with one of my friends who's a vet, and she's like, "I don't understand dosing in humans because, as a vet, I have to be really super specific about the breed, the body weight, the right. body composition, and be really right specific amount of medication or whatever I'm doing." But for humans, we're like, "Yeah, whatever." Yeah. <laughs> so you're a 180 pound dude you have this amount of gabby pinton and you're a 120 pound woman you have the same amount exactly. <laughs> yeah. okay i want to tackle we have just uh we have about five five ten minutes left i want to tackle issues of gut health so um sort of a broad question what are the benefits of having a healthy gut microbiome and what can we do male and or female to ensure that our gut microbiome is healthy and what are the, the nice downstream effects of that? Yeah, uh, gut microbiome, super, super important, right? We see that it is, I think I read somewhere that we have more gut bacteria than we have human cells. Is that crazy? <laughs> yeah, crazy. I know. Uh, so super important to take care of that. And we want a, a massive amount of diversity because it feeds forward to good metabolism, brain health, all of the things, right? And we also want to decrease the obesogenic aspect of the gut, right? So if we have less diversity, then we end up with more of an obesogenic gut, which increases our body's, you know, putting on body fat. Um, so one of the key things that happens in perimenopause, because I'm going to go back to that, and we see it in aging men too, is this decrease in diversity. Now, specifically in perimenopause, we start to see an increase in body fat, especially the cereal fat. And we're seeing more and more research coming out because it ties to the estrobiome. So we know that sex hormones are metabolized in the liver and they're wrapped and conjugated, you know, with sex hormone binding globulin and then excreted into the gut through bile. And there they're unbound and then shot back out in the circulation. So when we are starting to lose our sex hormones, we have a decrease in the diversity in our gut microbiome because we don't have as much of that conjugated sex hormone coming into the gut. So we have a decrease in the, in the diversity 
and we see an increase in what we call the Firmicutes phyla. So that is the obesogenic phyla because there's this lack of sex hormones coming in. So then the bad gut bacteria comes and pushes it up and it's a combination of higher cortisol. It's a combination of changes in uh, estrogen levels as well as insulin sensitivity. So we see this huge decrease in diversity. So this is one of the reasons why women who are in peri and early postmenopause have body composition changes, mood disorder, uh, just a lot of the signs and symptoms of it. Um, so increasing the diversity is super important. We're talking about, you know, taking more of the Japanese approach where most of your food is, is really good fibrous fruit and veg, and then you're accenting with meat. But I don't want people to downplay the protein aspect because protein is super, super important as well for increasing the diversity as, and then also lean mass and all the other things. Thank you.